welcome to the ANA eLearning Academy. Today we have Jean McPherson, who is going to be presenting on cast bronze money from the Roman and Ro Roman Republic and Central Italy. Um, if you have any questions during this presentation, you will be muted. So please put it in either the chat or the Q&A and I will read it at the end. Uh, go ahead. All right, thank you, Logan. And I appreciate all you folks sitting in, morning or afternoon, depending on where, where you're sitting. My talk today will be cast bronze money from the Roman Republic and Central Italy. Uh, the reason I say Central Italy is it could be before the Roman Republic was founded or it could have been outside of the area controlled by Rome. Uh, Rome was founded in 753 BC and they started producing coins about 300 BC. Uh, Cast bronze in several forms was used as money in the in the Republic in Central Italy before coins were struck by those same folks. Uh, this talk will cover the reasons for using money, uh, cast bronze forms, uh, coins, and then a little bit on on coin books, the ones that cover this subject. Just a real quick look. This is the early cast bronze money. Uh, you can see in the picture here, uh, some fairly large pieces were used, some fairly small pieces were used, and exactly how, how they changed hands, we don't really know, uh, or I don't really know, maybe others do, but some of this almost certainly was used as money uh, in the 1000 to 300 BC time period. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about coins. These look a lot more like what you're used to seeing as, as coins or numismatic. Uh, these are cast bronze. Some of these are pretty good size. Uh, some of them are about the size of my thumbnail. So, so they go from pretty small to pretty big. And I will talk about coin books. Uh, probably the best one I have on the subject is Oz Grawey and other words in German that I can't pronounce by Dr. Haberlin. This one was written in 1910. It has some excellent photographs, uh, especially for, for being a, a book produced in 1910. And, uh, and he has a lot of data. If, if you look to the recent, more recent books, almost all of them refer back to average weights by Haberlin, weight ranges by Haberlin, count in Haberlin. So this is a really nice book, but the way to get, get it if you don't go buy one is uh, you can find it online. And then right here are a couple of pieces of that I used to help attribute coins, a couple of scales. My original scale was too small when I got something bigger. And uh, I had a, a manual micrometer that my son decided I needed a digital one. And so he, he bought me that one year for Christmas. The digital is really nice. Um, I'm going to replay a story that I've told a few times. I collect uh, Roman coins. It's a cosmic payback for how bad I was to my eighth grade Latin teacher. I bought a, a Roman coin at a coin show. It was the Gallienus stag, stag, late Roman bronze from, you know, 300 AD. I took it to class and she told me to sit down and be quiet. I was not a very good student after that or before. And, uh, and so this is payback for, for how bad I was to, to our, my eighth grade Latin teacher. My interest in Roman pre-money started when I was reading uh, about Roman paying their soldiers for the first time in Vey. When they invaded Vey, it was about a four or five or 10 year campaign, depends on how you look at it about 400 BC, and it was 100 years before they produced coins. So how did they pay? Uh, let's see, so I'll, I'll go into, into that. Just a quick timeline on Rome, uh, the Bronze Age, which was about 1800 to 1200 BC, Rome had a pretty uniform population. Uh, the late Roman Bronze Age, 1200 to 900, uh, folks started to 
immigrate into Italy and uh, the way what you see in the archaeological record has changed over over that time, uh, how they buried people, what the ceramics look like and that sort of thing. The Iron Age began about 900 BC. And so I, I wondered why is it Rome used cast bronze for money when the Iron Age had already started and they were using iron for, for a lot of the tools and implements. I don't know whether it was because it was left over from previous ages or they just had mines that produced that. Um, in 753, Rome was founded on the seven hills on, on the Tiber. They were ruled by kings for several years and, uh, and then they converted to a republic. The oldest writings in Rome are the Centuriat Organization by King Servus Tullus. And in that particular organization, they mention money. Uh, and that's 200 years before they made coins. In uh, 400 BC, Rome invaded they and started to pay coin, pay soldiers. Uh, the timeline by Michael Crawford, the, the coin guy, is that in 300 BC, Rome started making coins. Uh, the earliest were cast, were struck bronze coins, not from Rome, but from some of the cities they, they defeated. And then about 280, they started making cast bronze coins. From uh, 264 to 241, Rome fielded large armies. They were fighting the Carthaginians. And the the country ran out of bronze to make coins. They eventually let several wealthy senators build the ships that, that won that war. And then if you come on down, uh, all of this 264 to 201 is a period when they made cast bronze coins. And you can see what inflation did to, to Rome. The ass in 225 was 268 on average. Uh, uh, just a couple of years later, it had dropped to 132, and then uh, not terribly longer, it had dropped to 40 grams. So it went from 327 down to 40 grams in about uh, 70 years. In, in 211, they started making silver denarii, and for the rest of, of the Republic, they paid soldiers in silver denarii. All right, so what is money? Uh, money is something used as a medium of exchange. Uh, it, it's also something that equilibrates things that you might trade without money changing hands. For instance, how many eggs do you give someone to buy a modius of flour? And a modius was a measure of, of uh, volume that the Romans used. It could be to balance your books. It could be to store wealth. One of the things about storing wealth is it has to be fairly small and it has to not go bad with time. You know, paper money is not very good as a store of wealth. Coins are better. Bullion might be better. Uh, anyway, that's how you, that's how we think bronze came to be uh, used by the Romans. And it was a means of paying Unusual things like paying soldiers, uh, paying taxes, buying luxury goods and such. You had to have something someone outside of your community wanted to, to, to buy things. Okay, this, this is the oldest mention that I'm aware of of money. And it was uh, written by Servus Tullius. He was ruler from 575 to 535. So again, that's what, uh, two, 300 years before Rome made their first coins. Uh, and it lists in asses how much money you had to have to be a certain type of soldier in the army. Uh, not just anyone could fight in the Roman Republican army. Uh, you know, the people that fought wanted the, the glory so that they could be elected to office and they wanted the, the wealth because you could uh, take war tributes back home and they went into your pocket as well as into the city's you know the country's pocket 
And so you had to be fairly wealthy to be a knight. Uh, and all the way down here, if you had about 10% as much as the richest folks, you could go out there with a sling and, and throw rocks at the enemy. And those guys stood at the back of the, of the army, attacking army. But anyway, this is several years before Rome produced coins that they're talking about asses. Uh, Titus Livius had a history of Rome, uh, and, he, and he wrote about the invasion of A. And to pay for the invasion of A, uh, the Senate decided they would tax people. Uh, and the reason they taxed people to pay soldiers was that people were losing their farms. Up until then, the wars had been fairly short. But this particular one lasted several years, several seasons. And so people were losing their farm because they were fighting and couldn't uh, couldn't do the management of their home home plots. And then it, it says here the senators were determined to make a big show that they supported this tax. And so let's see right here it says because coin money was not yet introduced, they carried copper by weight into in wagons to the treasury. And so that's an early mention of how Rome paid soldiers. Now, there are folks that think Livy's not the best historian around, that he made up a lot of things. And, and there are some, <laughs> some things that he did. But this is, a, is an early mention of money. And this was the one that got me off interested in collecting cast bronze pre-coins. And so, how did how did you pay with bronze? Some things were were bartered. Uh, you could determine the weight of things without ever having bronze pass hands. Uh, it could have been weighed, and the base unit for the bronze system was the libra or ass, and one ass weighed twelve uncia or ounces, and in today's terms, that's three hundred and twenty-seven grams. And so uh, small items could have been traded just by size. And this this one I like. How many pounds, U.S. pounds, of bronze would be a, a week's pay for a Roman soldier? And so they were paid three asses per day, seven days a week, times 327. That's 15 U.S. pounds. And it would look something like this. This scale holds 15 pounds of bronze bars. And it's in a steel yard scale. And uh, for all I know, that's what a week's pay would have looked like. I think they weren't paid every week, but that's what a week's pay would have looked like. And if you were gone months, it probably would take the better part of a wagon or a pack horse to, uh, to bring your stuff home. On the left-hand side, I show two scale weights, a one, one pound and a half pound scale weight. And on the other side of that balance is one and a half days pay in bronze. Now, a couple of museum photos. <coughs> These are in Rome and you can see they have the uh, cast bronze nuggets. They have some bronze bars. And uh, this is the oldest form of money. And this is an early hoard. Uh, they call it the Santa Marella Roma hoard. It was found in 1927. And it has both the cast coins and cast bars. So the two were traded at the same time. All right, so I'm going to quit, quit talking pretty soon and, and start showing pictures. Uh, early bronze shapes, they could have been A's rude. That, that was where you took molten bronze, dropped it into water, and it had a very irregular shaped uh, product. You could have poured it out like fudge and broken it into pieces, you know, broken plates or panes. Uh, could have been formed into ingots, bar, and then you made pieces of the ingots or bars. Some of those pieces and bars had marks. 
uh, Ramos Seco is, is a fairly common one. And those were early. Those, those were before Rome produced coins. Later, they produced currency bars. And I only have one picture of a currency bar here. Uh, those came into production about the same time as coins did. They're a much more refined product and they're bigger than coins. Some of the shapes were shells, uh, knuckle bones, or astrologa. If, if you broke a tool, you might end up putting that piece in your hoard of bronze. And there were some decorative pieces that we don't know whether they were decorations or whether they were really money, but those have been found with other hordes of bronze items. And so this is an A's rood uh, over here on, on the side. And, is a fairly large one that's uh, 70 grams i believe so that's about three ounces uh, this uh, it was sold as a piece of pre-money but i think it looks like a bronze carter pen and so these are various shapes that you might have found or at least i have found uh, sold uh, a's root and they most of them seem to be plates that are broken into pieces some of them are these really irregular uh, nuggets, and and this is the broken knife that I was that I mentioned earlier. Uh, broken planes or plates. These guys get pretty good size. Uh, most of the ones I have are less than a thousand grams, but they're pretty good size. That's like three Roman pounds. That's about a day's pay. Uh, and so this one is a cast bar with no, no no form on it. And then these two pieces, I think, looked like somebody poured out about a half inch of bronze and broke it into chunks. Again, these are less than a thousand grams. They're between 500 and a thousand grams. One of the nice things, or one of the things I've really enjoyed, I have a couple of Pretty good books. This one is uh, Garucci. I bought Garucci because uh, one of the dealers who sold me cast bronze said Garucci has excellent pictures. Now, that book was written in the 1800s, but you can find it online. And so there, this is two small pieces of a bronze plate, and they have a moon and a plus on it. And I have maybe a half a dozen of those. This is a Ramos Seco bar. It has lines and 45 degree angles, line down the middle. It's kind of hard to see. My, my photography is modest at best on this one, but it doesn't show very well either. Uh, this one's a much smaller bar, but you can see the lines a little bit better. And that's a Ramos Seco bar right here. And so what does Ramos Seco mean? It means dry branch. And so you can see the dry branches of a tree and what's on the bars look similar. And yeah, I did steal that picture from Dreams. Now, closer to the time Rome produced coins, they changed bars up a little bit. I don't know that there's a, a specific timeline for which one came first, but this one's called a fishbone. It's got similar lines to the Ramos Seco bars, but it's got circles, and that, those are called fishbones. And they have some that are dolphins. And I have a bar here. It's really hard to tell. It's such a small thing. Is that this dolphin tail in? And flipper, eh, it's possible on a good day, I can imagine that's what it is. On another day, I'll just imagine it's a Ramel Seco bar that looks like this. A lot of the cast bars don't have any form. Uh, and it's interesting to me, the, the molds must be, the space between the molds must be pretty big. I think of these as a little bit like uh, a chocolate bar and then you you break them into pieces and then obviously the chocolate bar was too big and then they break it into smaller pieces 
And so if you look here, these weights range from 200 to 800 grams. So it's less than one Roman pound up to oh, three, three Roman pounds. So it's less than a day's pay up to almost a day's pay. The biggest one is, is this guy right here. Okay, and for a lot of time, small broken pieces of, uh, of bars or coins were used by Romans for small change. And so the coin shown here is an early, one of the earliest cast bronze coins. And then next to it is a uh, small bronze piece with a, a plus and a moon. I haven't seen any explanation of what the plus and the moon are. I have been called a star or a sun and a moon, but I don't have any explanation. You can see there's another one here, there's a moon and a, and a plus or a cross. I think it's possible that that could have been intended to break the piece, but it, obviously it didn't on either one of these. And then on the, on the right here, you see uh, an unmarked bar, a Ramosecco bar, and a uh, bar with a, with a cross. This is kind of neat. It, it almost looks like a pie pan or a, or a bowl. They filled a, a hole with bronze. You can see that it's, it's formed pretty well on the outside edge, and the bottom of it's pretty rough. And this one, they broke into four roughly equal pieces. And this is, oh, 1,500 grams. So it's a pretty good sized piece, piece of bronze. 1,500, uh, 300 into that. It's, it's a couple of days pay. Most of the cast bronze don't have marks of value. It's possible this one does. Uh, you can see these are two one pound or one ass scale weights. Uh, and they're they're real. They're they're three twenty-seven plus or minus a couple of grams. So these are, if you would, full weight scale weights. This one is uh, six hundred and fifteen grams. So it's really, really close to two asses. And those would be called Dupontius. And so it's the only denomination of a Dupontius I have in cast bronze. And it's not a coin. It's a, uh, it's a piece of cast, cast metal. And the two ones on it are how you would mark either a scale weight or a Dupontius. And we have here just a few pictures these are three of the of the cast bronze bars. This one could either be a fish or a ramos seco. You can see the the fishbone pattern, the dry peat tree pattern better here, not so well here. But you can see the side of it. The two halves of the bar are offset a little bit, and they have a pretty good size uh, tang or whatever you want to call it. Uh, piece between the bars. This is a piece of triangular bar that was uh, rough on the bot on one side and smooth on two. So it was probably poured into a trough and you can see it was broken to length. One end is is smooth like these two. One end is is rough like this side. And the smallest bar that I pretend is Ramo Seco is it's like one or two ounces. It's so small you can't really see any more than the barest of one line like this. Now, later in the Republic, about 280, Rome made some currency bars. Uh, they've also been called A's, A's Signatum, and uh, the current preference in, in, in coin and book people is to call them currency bars. This is what one would look like, a full one. It's five to 10 Roman pounds. Uh, 
they were often broken. You can see that here. And, and this is two, two pieces of a half. And the only currency bar that I think I have is this, uh, eh, it's about a one Roman ounce weight. Uh, and you can see the foot, this foot right here. And you can tell this guy's a bull, it's an anatomically correct, so. Another form of, of bronze that folks had was uh, were shell and knuckle bones. You know, cavalry shells were used as currency in other places. We don't know that Rome used them. What we do know is that there were a lot of these cast bronze pieces, uh, some fairly heavy, some not, and they could have been money or they could have been something else. What we do know, and there's the astrologa or knuckle bone. Uh, shown here are some bronze, uh, a bronze bone, a silver one, a lead one, and five uh, bone with lead filling in them. There were coins that had both shells and knuckle bones on them when Point production started, and you can see uh, some here. Okay, the shell and astrologus. Uh, there were uh, T. Mabbitt back in 1943 suggested that uh, these could have been the first small change in the in the cash bronze uh, currency system. A lot of the Ast uh, astrologa and a lot of the shells are about the right weight to be either one or two uncia. That's you know twenty five or fifty grams. Um, I have some that are really close to that, but uh, I, I'm not as certain that that's what it is. But if you look up here, you'll see this is a two dot coin. It's a two. And it's got a shell on it. And so there were a lot of coins that had shells that uh, that were two uncia or two ounces. Uh, the astrologa was used on some one ounce coins, and I'll show you some of those later. I think probably as likely as anything is that a lot of cast bronze was found in uh, votive situations at some altar, at some bridge crossing or, or river crossing. And so they kind of like throwing a coin in to cross the river to, to appease the gods or to put some offering. When the Romans didn't have coins, they may have left bronze items. A's Rude, A's Grawe, both have been found in those. And Venus, her one of her symbols are shells. And uh, so it's entirely possible that a lot of the votive items for shells have to do with Venus. Uh, the astrologa were were uh, used as either gaming dice, children's games, or for divination. You know, if you wanted to go see the uh, the ladies predict the future, they throw out the bones and uh, tell you what was coming. It's possible that some of the shells. It, it has been proposed by folks that shells were used as scale weights. Uh, it is possible to find a set of weights, one, two, three, four ounces uh, that match it. But the problem is, I think that's only by picking and choosing. There's an awful lot of shells that don't fit that system. It's possible they could have, but it, it seems unlikely to me. David Hendon in his book lists bronze shells as scale weights. And then I mentioned tools. This is a, a broken axe, and this is a broken knife. Uh, if you had bronze and it wasn't of any use, you might put it in your hoard of, of treasures for later. Now, the odd, sh odd shapes, these are called palmettas. 
and I've seen quite a few of those offered. I don't know whether those are decorative items that people put on their furniture or chariots or belts or whether they were really money. Uh, but they have been found in hordes with other bronze items. And these are triangular bars. I call this one a teardrop. There's, I've seen a few of these out there. This is a couple of ounces worth. Uh, seed. There are some bronze pieces that look like seed and of course shell. And there's a valentine or a heart, if you will. That uh, This is probably a scale weight. All right. So now we're about ready to start talking about coins. Uh, a lot of us have had issues with postage in, in the mail. Uh, especially from Europe. The interesting thing about these is I got I bought these in, in mid-December and I got them before the end of the year. And so I call these my COVID uh, coins. They they braved the trip across the Atlantic to, to make it here. And it's the first one I've I've had that had a a rooster on it. Okay. I like to lay out the cast bronze coins this way. You can see on the left, I, I have uh, three different pages, if you will, obverse and reverse. That's why there's six uh, of coins. Uh, on the left-hand side of each one is the largest in the series that I have. And so this is an ass. It's, uh, it's a Janus on the front. It's a prow of a battleship on the back, and then it, it goes down in size to semi, which is a half ass, a triens, which is four uncia or ounces, a quadrans, which is uh, three uncia, a sextans, which is one sixth of a pound, and an uncia, which is one twelfth of a pound. And you can see with time, the size of this Janus head coin dropped. Uh, this is about one-fourth the size of the larger one. And it's presumed to be 20 or 30 years later vintage. Okay, so cast coins. How, how, did you, how would you attribute a cast coin? Uh, if you're interested, I have a, a article in the TNA magazine coming out in March, and it'll cover this in a, a little more detail than I do here today. But what I'll do today is I'll, I'll talk a little bit and I'll show you more coins. Um, ancient coins are normally put into one of two groups, either Greek or Roman. Um, if it's a cast coin, it's a Roman Republican coin. If it's considered Greek, it's because it was produced in a city outside of the influence of Rome. Either after Rome defeated them, they were allowed to make their own coins, or it was before Rome defeated them. And so those coins are identified in the manner that Greek coins are identified. They're, they're done by city or region. Uh, very, very few coins have inscriptions that identify where the coin was produced. If you go back up to this picture, uh, maybe hard to see, but Hatria put put the city their city name on, and you can see H A T and A, and on the other side an H. Uh, these coins had a city name. Uh, this group Tudor had a had a city name. There is one right here. One city, one coin from the city of Rome that had Roma on it, and this all I have is a small broken piece, but here it is right here. So all the rest of them do not have any identification of, of mint location. Uh, most mint dates are expressed by ranges. The coins were not dated. Uh, archaeology, archaeological evidence mostly determines what. Uh, what dates should be put on the coin. 
some amount of uh, looking at, at the iconography or whatever is on the coin and deciding who used those type symbols uh, helped place coins both date and time. But mostly it's when it was dug up, what layer did it, did you find it and what was around it? Uh, most dates are 210, 280 to 210 BC. The older series are the heaviest, where the 1S is really close to the 327 grams that we think a Roman pound was. Uh, more recent coins, they like I said, they dropped off really quick. And so uh, they call them the semi-unsoil when they were half that weight. Uh, quadrantial when they were a quarter that way, the substantial when they were one sixth that way and, and so forth. So uh, the older ones are heavier, the newer ones are lighter. In terms of denominations, there's two series of uh, of cash bronze coins or two two types. All of them are based on a large coin that could be called an ass. Uh, and so the one ass coin is a uh, Libra and they would normally have a mark of value on it. And so if you look at the coin behind me, it just has a single one on it. Uh, the, the semi is half, a, half an ass and it has an S on it. And then when you get down into smaller coins, you have a tri-ins, which is one third, and it's four on Sia and it has four dots, a quadrans, is three and sia and it has three dots. A sextons, you know, one sixth is two ounces and it has two dots. And uh, an uncia is one twelfth and it has one dot. Uh, there are some half ounce or half uncia coins and they have no dots. There are a few coins, coin series, like the ones from Lucia, and I'm sure I didn't pronounce that right that have a unit called a numus or an ass. Uh, they were broken into 10 ounces. And so a numus would be 10 and sia with no mark of value. Uh, a quincinex, and I, I'll show you that later, has five dots. And so that's half an ass. It would be a semi or a quincinex because it has five dots on it. There's a quatrinex with four dots. A Tercius with three dots, a Bionix with two dots, and an Uncia with one. And as before, if you have uh, a half Uncia, they have no dots. Early authors of coins, uh, especially Haberlin, but Haberlin and Garucci, didn't really know what uh, the breakdown of these coins were. And so Haberlin calculates the equivalent ass or equivalent full-size coin of the Lucerian coins by assuming there's either 10 or 12 ounces per coin. And, and, and what you do is that for the oldest coin, you'd expect the fractions to add up to 327 grams. Uh, and so if you had a one on Sia, you multiply 12 times at 27 grams and that gets you the 327. With, with the 10 ounce per ass coin, uh, a one out, a one on Sia would be 32 grams. Uh, most, most coins are identified by the obverse and reverse description of the, of the ass. And then the physical description of the coin would include weight, diameter, grade, and anything notable. Now, I have one or two uh, coin descriptions in the, at the bottom. Okay, and so for, for this presentation, I put all of, all of my Libras, all of the one pound coins in, in one set of pictures. This is the obverse. Uh, the coin that I mentioned that has the name Roma on it is right here. And you can see I didn't flip it over for that picture. But there's uh, three coins that are all Janus on the obverse, prowl on the reverse. Some prowls go right, some prowls go left. Uh, this one is Hercules. 
and the horse, and it's got the L from for Lucerio. Uh, this one, this this fraction right here, it's too small to be able to tell what it really is. But my guess, it's a, an ass based on this little line right here, which would be right here on some. And then this is a, one of my more recent coins. It, it came in right before the end of the year, and it's got uh, a rooster and Apollo. And so if you look at, at these coins, this is a lady. This is a lady. This is two guys. And so I, I think it's sometimes hard to tell feminine and masculine apart in ancient coins, especially when it's Apollo or Roma. Okay, a half a half of Libra is a semi, and uh, this is Roma, Saturn, a bull, Pegasus, and so you have different uh, characters on the obverse. Remember, I mentioned an, a a quincinix or a five dot coin. You can see on this this coin over here, there's five dots, or maybe you can't. But anyway, it has five dots indicating it's half of the 10-ounce uh, full-size coin. And these are other ones. This particular one is kind of interesting. It's got a, a harp on the back and a sleeping dog, which didn't, didn't show very well here. Uh, one of the best pictures, I thought, is one of the smallest ones. This is Saturn. Okay, a triens, and I always thought this seemed odd. A triens is a third of an ass, but it has four dots. So a triens has four dots, and a quadrans has three dots. It makes more sense when you say it's one third of a full size. And so these are four dot coins. Uh, horse head, horse head. I call that one my godfather coin because, you know, I remember the godfather put a horse head in some guy's bed. And of course, these guys are Romans too. Um, this one has, is related to Hercules. It has a club on one side and it's also related to Zeus. It has a thunderbolt on the other side. So these guys were covering both of their bases. Um, thunderbolt and dolphin, that's fairly common. There's a hand and two corn ears. Uh, this one's interesting. It has two clubs. So that's kind of related to Hercules, but it has a cestius. And what that is, is a boxing glove from uh, Roman times. And, a and that particular glove had leather wrapping and, an, and brass knuckles. And so it, it did a lot of damage if you hit somebody with a set of brass knuckles, and that's what a cestius is. It was this particular piece, and you can see the leather strap kind of on the back of the hand. And so this is a closed fist with the uh, brass knuckles. Anyway, that's a triens. A quadrans, uh, you can see I have a few more of them than I do the the triens or semi or or full size. And this one has uh, three Hercules full size coins, a half coin. And on this particular one, you can see Hercules' face. This one's Hercules, it's kind of hard to tell, so I actually there's four of those guys. And then I have one with a dog and wheel and a frog and an anchor. I think as an aside on this one, you can see the frog is pointed up and the anchor is pointed up. Eastern European folks tended to show their anchor pointed up. Western European, Western Mediterranean folks showed it pointing down. And, and an interesting part here is that this is a pig pig coin almost all of the coins i have have metal turn meaning if you if you look at the obverse of the coin and rotate it holding 12 and 6 the same it will be pointed correctly oops 
on this particular coin, it's a coin turn. You can see a little crack here and a little crack here. And the pig's upside down in this coin and right side up in this one. That's the first coin that, that I, uh, cast bronze coin that I had that was not metal turn. And so I asked folks, is that common? And they said, no, it's not very common, but it does happen some. And I have one metal turn coin and I have one coin that's at a three o'clock turn angle. All of the other cast bronze coins, where you can tell, are, uh, are metal turn. Let's see. It's kind of hard to tell whether a wheel is coin or metal turn because it, it could be pointed anyway. All right, here we have an Uncia. If you remember, I mentioned that. Uh, oh, I, I skipped one. It's Quadrans Sex. Where is it? Quadrans. Okay, I'm out of order here. Sorry about that. We have uh, Sextons. That's one sixth of an ass. And as I mentioned earlier, that Sextons often have shells on them. And so you can see. Quite a few of these do. There's a shell here, here. Um, several of these group do. And, and this is, these are one sixth of a, of an ass. And so this coin and this coin and uh, these two coins are earlier issues. And the reason I say that is that if you take that this particular coin, it's a sexton, so you multiply it times six. It the six times that weighs more than a one ass three hundred and twenty seven gram piece. It's more like three fifty, and so this one it you would say is an early issue of that particular coin. Uh, the same thing of these two. These two are early issues of the knuckle bone shell coin and this is a later issue of the exact same coin and you can see how much smaller they are uh, I guess this one right here it, it, it's an equivalent ass of about 340 grams and this one right here is more like 80 grams so, so it's about four times as big this one's an interesting one it's a, it's a cicada and a trident that one's another one where it, it's hard to tell which one is which way is up. There's a whole series of coins that have clubs on them. The only ones that I have are, are sextons, and and these tend to be oval shaped in the shape of the club, more or less. And this particular one has two dots on the back, and you can see this is an earlier issue and this is a later issue. Same thing, uh, the earlier issue being. Uh, Larger. This one is a Dias Curry, Dias Curry, right and left. And then let's see, this one with the hat on the bottom. Remember, I mentioned Hatria. So that, that's one of the few coins that has a location on it. On the back, it has a rooster. I went from having no roosters to within the space of a month having two on cast coins. Uh, this one has a, a diaxis of about 130. You know, so if, if this is 12 and, and this is three, 130 is about halfway between it. So that coin, if you rotate it around holding six and 12, it's, it's at uh, 130. That's a very unusual diaxis. And it could be an indication that it's something's not right and you ought to check and see what others look like. Some of these, uh, you can find hundreds of examples. Some of them, I, I was lucky to find 10. So the rarity, the rarity of, of cast coins is, is, is pretty good. They're fairly rare. Uh, the only thing rarer than a cast coin, cast bronze coin, are uh, collectors of cast bronze. So that's a good thing. Okay, the Uncia is 112th. And you can see here... Uh, Several different ones. One of the 
recurring themes are the knuckle bones. You can see all of these have a knuckle bone on the uh, one side. Two of them have knuckle bones on both sides. One has a dot on the second side. Uh, if you remember down here, this particular coin has a knuckle bone on one side, but since it has the shell on the other, we assume it's a, it's a sextant, and it is a sextant. Uh, some of these are interesting. You, you heard me mention a an anchor position. This particular coin, we think it's it's properly pointed, and the anchor points down. So that seems to me like it would be a Western Mediterranean coin versus an Eastern Mediterranean location. Uh, this particular coin also has a, a city name on it. It's just the abbreviation, but it's got a city name. Uh, And this particular coin has an L for Listeria. So anyway, those are those are Uncias. They're fairly common. You see them for sale quite a bit. The two most common coins I see for sale are Sextons and Uncia. Uh, And then here I have some semi uncias They they normally are no daughters. Um, they, this particular coin they have interesting pieces. This is a well, not sure what that is. You can see a sigma on this particular coin and a sigma on this particular coin. That indicates they're semi uncias uh, This one's from Hatray. It's got a gorgon on the front. This is a really small later issued uh, dolphin coins. Some of those get to be full size. This particular coin is kind of hard to tell. It's a beetle on this side. And, and mine is not a good enough example that you can see the head and the feet. A couple of them I found online do. And this particular one here has been called three or four different things, a cross, a star, a sun, or a flower. And and based on the coins that I find online, not this one, I would say that's most likely a four-petal flower. You've got a little indentation in the middle, and there's some kind of arch on the petals here. Okay, and how, how would you attribute a coin? So this this is a this is a hand two grain ear coin. Uh, it was a Crawford 14.4. It was minted somewhere 280 to 276 BC. Uh, it's called a quadrans. It has, it's the series is Dioscuri Mercury. So if you looked at the ass coin of this, it would be Dioscuri on one side and Mercury on the second side. Uh, Obverse is a right hand. And then at left, there are three pellets. On the other, on the reverse are two barley grains, and they typically show barley grains. They're always called that, as opposed to wheat. Uh, and between it, you have the three pellets. And so this is a three daughter. It's a quadrant. Uh, you can see where the flan was broken from the casting sprue on both sides. It has a green patina, and since I'm red-green colorblind, I couldn't tell you for sure. But I read it is, and I, my wife tells me it is. This is an earlier coin. It has an equivalent ass weight of 321, meaning if you multiply it times uh, four, you get 331 grams. And a, and a normal one Libra is 327. So that's a, an earlier, heavier coin. Okay, and all I did here is I mentioned, I, I picked this quote up from Becky, uh, and I'll show you his book later. On most coins, I'll, I'll give the obverse, reverse, comments, and then the weight in grams and diameter. And so most coins, I'll give both the largest diameter and the smallest diameter to give an indication of how round they are. 
And most of these are pretty round, and so that's usually an indication of how big the break was where the corn was broken off from others. And also give the diet the thickness. And this one's 12 millimeters thick. I have several coins that are 12 millimeters thick. And this is by far not the thickest of the bronze coins I have. But it does, it, it's nice and heavy when you're holding onto it. All right. You can go get a cup of coffee now because I'm going to start talking about, about books. Am I, Logan, how close am I to end? Uh, you're about five minutes. Oh, wow. Then I'll have to go through this real quick. <laughs> this is my list of books. Uh, Crawford, uh, Gruber, Crawford, Sydenham, Sear. The two best books on the list are both by Vecchi, uh, Italian Cast Coins, and uh, uh, they're both Italian Cast Coins. Uh, Historia Numorum Italy, that's a, a by Ruder, that's a pretty good one. The Greek Coins of Italy, this is pretty old. It's like a 19, uh, 1800s book. Historia Numorum, which is uh, 1910, it talks about Greek coins. And then Seer, Greek coins and values. And so the, the right four books are, are Greek. One, two, three, five books. The two by Vecchi cover all cast bronze, or most all cast bronze. And then the left ones are uh, Roman Republican. Now, in addition, I have several books that are a bit on the older side. These are all cast bronze, mainly. Uh, the very bottom one are the plates by, by Haberlin. The next one up is Garucci. I bought that book because uh, the fellow who sold me one of my first cast bronze pieces mentioned that is a good reference. And, and it's back from the 1800s. As I mentioned, the two Vecchi books are good. Uh, the A. Signatum book is good, but I don't have any. That's Those are currency bars. And then the next one up, if you go one book older than Garucci, it's uh, the Kirchhoff Museum from 1839. The next one up is the Vatican Collection. And then the book on top with a fuzzy end is uh, Sydenham's book, A's Grave. Probably the two at the bottom and the A's Grave are the best. And then the old ones and then the modern are the Vecchi books. And then here I have a list. Uh, it, it'll get posted on at Logan. So, so if you're interested in the list, these are the books. Uh, the top two are what I would consider the best. Crawford is the best Republican coin book, but he doesn't cover all of the all of the coins. The A's Grave book by Sydenham in 1926 is pretty good. They're fairly hard to find. Uh, Haberlin, excellent book. Excellent place, and I'll show you a couple real quick. You can find Haberlin online. What I would say, though, is that every time I post a link for Haberlin's book, next time I go back, it's it's not there. So you're better off just Googling this name, uh, A's Grave, Heavy Money of Rome in Central Italy, Italy by Haberlin, 1910, and you'll plop up a PDF copy of it. Uh, then there's Garucci and Kirchhoff, and then a lot of Italian coin books include cast bronze coins. And so the next, next that's what these next ones are. I also have the catalog by of, of the Sydenham collection. That's pretty nice. Uh, let's see, is there anything else worth mentioning here? No. Okay, and so... This page is, if you're going to buy one book on cast coins, I would suggest you buy this one. This is the most recent book by Vecchi. It's Italian Cast Coinage, published in 2013. You can buy them for next to nothing. Um, and so the, and it has good pictures. It, these are pictures from it. You'll notice I have these two coins. Uh, this coin I mentioned with a hat on the bottom. 
So it has good pictures and a lot of good information. Most of you are familiar with books by Sear. This is uh, Greek coin values by Sear, and he does have a fair number of coins, eh, but nowhere near all of them. Uh, in in Hatria, he shows two coins, or he mentions the cast ass and the cast uncia. And so I have the uncia. He doesn't mention the semi uncia, which is this one right here, but it has some coins in there. Pictures. Uh, these are tables by Haberlin. Haberlin really liked big coins. He has hundreds of, of this Janus Prowl right or left uh, cast bronze ass. Uh, hundreds of them. And you have to believe that that wasn't the most common coin that they made, but he really liked them. And so he went and found them and he recorded them. And you see not only pictures of a good number of the coins, he has the, the weights as well, and the location where they're, they were found and the location where they're stored. Uh, this is a similar picture to the Haberlin picture. And it's from the, from the Sydenham sale catalog. And Sidden, uh, that catalog has eight double pages of, of photos. And they're pretty good. You can actually see what they look like. Some of the some of the books use castings for their photos or sketches, and it's pretty hard to tell. I would think I could tell what that coin was if I had it in my hand. Um, Garucci. Garucci's a little bit older than Haberlin, and he does. There are just all manner of shapes that he calls is great or cast bronze money. And that's it. That's that's what I have. All right. Thank you. Uh, so far, we have two questions. The first one, can you give some of your thoughts or comments on authenticating a screwed when they lack provenance? And do it. It's just not possible. <laughs> I mean, you need to buy from a reputable dealer. Mm -hmm. uh, with with the cast coins, you should know what they look like. You can go find on online pictures of what they look like. You can buy books and see what they should look like. You should do your diligence and decide what they should look like and buy from a reputable dealer. Uh, it, you just have to be careful. Uh, I cannot tell you. I went to on vacation in, in Reno, and there was a cast bronze guy there. And I went on vacation in uh, uh, New Orleans, and there was a cast bronze guy there. And I asked both of those guys, how can I make the patina of what you're making look like my 2,000-year-old cast coin? He says, I can do it. Just tell me what you want it to look like, and I'll make it look like that. So yeah. I think it's not possible to tell. You, you can get an indication. You know, the, the coin behind my head is, it's a cast bronze coin. It's not smooth surface. Uh, it doesn't look like it's a recently produced piece, but it's really hard to tell. And that leads to the next question. Where do you buy these coins? Most of mine come from overseas auctions. Uh, if he wants to Google me or, or send me a note, I'll, I'll tell him. Uh, okay. But but there's two or three places uh, that offer them. If you go to many, most of the ancient coin dealers, you know, CNG is one in the United States. They sell a few. Uh, I bought several from Pegasi at coin shows. Uh, there's a place called DEA Moneta. Those folks have dealers. Uh, that's where the fellow told me to go buy a book by Garucci. Uh, I actually bought a coin from Vecchi. You know, he, he saw my book by Vecchi. He had a coin, sh coin shop, and I bought a coin from him. Well, yeah, we actually have at our big show an ancient world section, so I'm sure that's a good place to search for things. Sure. 
Um, and I think that's all of the questions. Thank you all for joining us and thank you for your great presentation. You all have a great week and we hope to see you on some future uh, webinars.